Hello, you're listening to 175th special episode of Web Standard Podcast. I'm your host, Vadim McKeith from HTML Academy. We're at Google I.O. in California together with Greg uh, Whitworth. Hello, Greg, and tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my name's Greg Whitworth, as he just said. Uh, I'm actually, I work on Microsoft Edge, uh, the rendering engine specifically. Uh, I'm also part of the CSS working group. Uh, prior to working on Microsoft Edge, I was a web dev for over a decade, both at like ad agency mm -hmm. level as well as uh, in the enterprise. All right, we're at Google I/O. This is mm -hmm. my it's my first Google I/O, but uh, have you have you seen any any talks, interesting ones? Yeah, yeah, it's been it's been uh, pretty exciting. It's been hot. Uh, oh yeah, I got a sunburn. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, it's been enjoyable. I've, I've really enjoyed, uh, a lot. Like this morning, I went to a Nicole Sullivan's talk, which was, a you know, about working with frameworks, uh, and to improve the web platform, which I think is just a, a wonderful idea. And they, she was showing a lot of, um, her, uh, her and her colleague were just showing a lot of, uh, performance benefits that they've seen in working with, uh, the Reacts and Views, um, uh, of the world. And, uh, Like that's so far probably been my my favorite talk. Um, it's been exciting also during like the web developer keynote. Well, it wasn't web developer keynote, but the developer keynote. Uh, just seeing uh, you know all the things that uh, they're doing uh, within the web platform. To, you know, you know, move the web forward. And uh, there was a lot of native talk too, which was kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, and then I've also taken in a few of the TensorFlow. Uh, talks, which are also, of course, really interesting, yeah. the things they're doing with that. Personally, I wasn't impressed during web keynotes because mm. I, I've I heard everything they mention, mentioned apart from uh, uh, Google Bot going evergreen. Yeah. But yeah. The, the rest, like la last month news. Sure, yeah. I didn't I didn't necessarily learn anything new, but I never have a gauge of what everybody else knows because a lot of time I'm in the standards and uh, Google and Chrome do a good job of being engaged there. So a lot yeah. of it I kind of already know as well, but um, it's always good to hear kind of the chatter around, like as you're sitting there and you hear web devs, you yeah. know, like the late lazy loaded attribute. There were folks around me that got kind of excited. So yeah, I, I was surprised just to hear and see how many people didn't know that it's already there because I mm -hmm. saw Edis Money's article like a month ago. Yeah, I saw a lot of tweets about it, and a lot of people they probably don't follow Eddie. Yeah, how yeah. is it possible? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, standards in general, I think. Uh, You, you know, I, I think it's easy for us to forget a lot of times that web developers have, you know, focuses, you know, they, they have daily jobs that they have to contribute on. Uh, okay. And in, uh, on Monday, there was a build uh, mm -hmm. conference. Yeah. What's the official Microsoft build or? Yeah, yeah. It's Microsoft just... build. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, interestingly very similar to Google I.O. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, Microsoft's entire, like all of Microsoft uh, developer conference. Right here in, in California as well. No, no, no. It's up in, uh, it's up in Seattle. All right. Um, and so... Uh, basically, they just bring together all of Microsoft and all the different, you know, developer-centric type things um, to kind of show you what Microsoft is doing from cloud to office mm -hmm. to, you know, um, web development, Microsoft Edge. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a pretty exciting time for Microsoft as well. And I'm really excited to, uh, where we're heading and what we're offering developers these days. Yeah, that's, that's good. I, I was I was thinking to, to attend it, but uh, it wasn't really possible with, uh, with this tight uh, Google I.O. Yeah. schedule. Yeah, it's interesting that they're so close, close together. Yeah, but it's uh, at the same time, uh, it's a good thing because people uh, might have a chance to attend both. Yeah, yeah, that, that's definitely a good thing, especially when uh, a lot of people come from you know other countries. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, the the biggest announcement uh, for me personally was this IE mode in Edge. Okay, coming somewhere this year probably. Uh, yeah, yeah, I definitely don't want to say like definitely happening, but yeah, IE mode is a super exciting feature uh, and. Um, You know, there there will actually be more news, uh, hopefully in the summer about mm -hmm. that. Um, but the thing that I'm just excited about is there's there's a fine line that um, the Microsoft uh, Microsoft Edge has always had to, you know, uh, we we have a lot of different customers. We have you know consumers, we have web developers, and we also have the enterprise. And and a lot of the, and you can't just you know throw one of them away because it, it benefits another customer segment. Um, and so it's, it's really hard because we very much desire everybody to be on the modern latest things. We're working in the standards bodies going and implementing. We want them to use all that latest and greatest, but we also empathize and respect that a lot of a legacy line of business applications still do need to run and function. And those enterprises don't see a ton of ROI of going and upgrading those. And some of them, they potentially just can't because yeah. of the fact that they need, still need to run in the environments that they're in. Um, and so it, it's that healthy balance, and I really like this approach mm -hmm. uh, because of the fact that the user never has to leave. It's just a new tab, and it's almost opaque to the user. They're not yeah. even aware yeah. that it's happening. 
Uh, and so then you just open a new tab and you're now in modern. Whereas, you know, kind of what we did in the Edge HTML days, you actually popped open true IE 11. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this, I think, gives you that really fluid, uh, again, like really successful in, in my hopefully successful route for enterprises to adopt it. And you'll see hopefully, you know, lower usage on modern sites of Internet Explorer. Okay, but it's not a completely new thing. You used to have uh, different uh, IE versions under under the hood of like uh, IE 7, 8, 9 and different modes. Uh, yeah, like, the, yeah, they, the, they weren't true modes. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say that's that's the difference. And yeah, I, I definitely wouldn't compare the two. Um, this is just IE 11. As, so as no, no conditional comments. No, no, yeah, the... Uh, the i11, as it's known in the box today, just you know rendered within the uh, Microsoft Edge on Chromium. So it's basically like uh, a, a Windows magic to 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 merge two windows together. Yeah. Uh, yep. Okay. So w- w- instead of two icons in the next version of Windows, you'll have just a single icon with. A mode. I don't think they've uh, figured that part out, and All I right. can't speak to that. So. Okay, but I'm I'm trying. As, to as I said, there there'll be. Probably more news about that, hopefully, in the summer. Okay, but first of all, it will bring Edge to Windows 7, for, for example, mm-hmm. as, a, as a modern browser, because it's the mm-hmm. IE 11 is the, is the only pre-installed browser yeah. that you can have. Yeah. So uh, I, I, I remember the, this evening when, when you're at probably early morning here in California, mm-hmm. uh, or at least in Seattle, when, when, when you announced uh, that you're moving to Chromium. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I asked Patrick Kettner, Okay. Uh, like, what's going on, Patrick? <laughs> what's the what's the reason behind it? What's uh-huh. and uh, he said like uh, we need to have a bigger market market share basically mm. because like Windows 10 is not enough for for Microsoft as a com- as a company to have it. Just which which you kind of saw about a year ago, maybe a year and a half at this point, where you know we released Microsoft Edge on iOS and Android yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, to kind of start addressing that um and that is one of the key factors with switching is is it allows us to go everywhere um yeah, because yeah. that was a reality being tied to the OS uh bug fixes uh new features were tied to the latest Windows 10 um release uh which has its pros and cons and one of the cons is you know not everybody upgrades right away to the latest Windows 10 and so um there's a you know there's an uptake that needs to happen there um and it, and it ultimately does happen but uh Sometimes not necessarily as quickly as we want them to, especially mm-hmm. when they're you know you're having compat issues on websites and stuff. Yeah, I remember around like fifteen or like twelve years ago. I'm 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 old. I'm, uh, and and uh, there was a situation when uh, I think Apple announced that they're launching Safari on Windows. Mm. Like and and we were so surprised. Like why 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 would it do that? On one hand, on the other hand, we were really happy to have. Uh, it was the first web kit on Windows. Mm. I wonder. If we were, if you were planning to have Edge uh, as as it is as it is now without Chromium on mm-hmm. on off the other platforms, is it actually possible to do so? I mean, it's 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 always technically feasible. It's the amount of time to make it happen, mm-hmm. and and what is the you know what is the return on that investment? Um, and a lot of times uh, when we would discuss it with folks, like just I'll I'll give you my own personal experience and talking to web does about that. Mm-hmm. You know. Uh, I, you know, I would, we would encourage them to test Microsoft Edge and they would say, bring it to back and I will. And so then the follow up request is like, oh, will you, will you use it as your primary browser? And they're like, no. And so yeah. it, it kind of starts leading you in that, like, as you think about it, is it worth, uh, that time and energy? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and maybe yes on one hand and maybe no on another. It's just, we have, a, we have a weird problem here in, in, a, in the area where I work. I work in education. So we teach basic HTML and CSS, mm-hmm. and uh, one of our requirements is to test in uh, real real browsers. Mm-hmm. And if you have a Windows, you have no way to test your your site in in Safari, for example. Mm-hmm. You need to have device, actual device. Yeah. There's, there's no way to virtualize it somehow. Mm-hmm. And you did a really good job uh, providing those virtual machines, yeah, the uh, VMs, yeah. VMs with with uh, Edge and IE. Yeah. So. Thank you for that because it makes makes uh, education uh, really really much much easier. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a decent approach for the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, but now we are struggling to probably we'll just remove uh, Safari from from support list because I mean at least at education step there's there's mm-hmm. no way to tell your student like just get an iPhone or just get a MacBook. Mm-hmm. No, no, it doesn't work like that. And there's you can you can pay a lot of money for like browser stack, mm-hmm. but that's too much for for a student. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's it is kind of unfortunate. Yeah. 
but it's good to have uh, Edge as a cross cross platform browser. Yeah, I'm super excited about it. I, I'm I'm very excited about the opportunity that we have ahead of us. I read an interesting article uh, by Tom Warren uh, at at Verge, I believe, uh, mm. inside Microsoft decision to work with Google on Edge. Mm. Uh, how close to truth? Um, so uh, I, I read the article. Um, uh-huh. You know, I can't, I can't speak for anybody uh, really <laughs> that, that high on, on the chain uh, uh, for some of them. But, yeah, I mean, it, it is Does a it reality. Make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of the points that it hits on is, is very accurate. Like, uh, like, for example, being able to, you know, go down to Windows 7 and support yep. the yep. enterprise customers that aren't able to, you know, uh, come up to Windows 10. Um, and then, and then on top of that, like the web developers, like, I mean, it's a, it's a key customer of ours that we, we interact with a ton. Um, and we want them to be able to test the stuff that we have so that mm-hmm. they're ultimately making great experiences for our end users. Cause that's why we build a browser and that's also why they build websites. And so ultimately at the end of the day, our shared users, we just want them to have a great experience. And so while, yeah, it's kind of a bittersweet moment to, you know, yeah. kind of say goodbye to Edge HTML, I'm actually very excited about kind of what it unlocks for the potential of the web going forward. Okay, that's good. I remember in, in October 2012, I was mm. sitting uh, in Oslo office of Opera, mm-hmm. and I wrote a tweet, uh, something like, life will never be the same. Mm. Because in October, they announced inside of a company that we're switching from Presto, yeah. our homegrown engine, to mm-hmm. Chromium. Yeah, and I was really shocked and surprised and uh, and optimistic mm. mostly because mm-hmm. uh, I was working in in um, Devrel team uh, uh, mm-hmm. mostly on uh, web compat, just mm. like Mozilla doing right now. Yeah, so it was a unsolvable task mostly. Mm. So mm. we were we were fighting impossible problem. Mm-hmm. So I was I was. Optimistic, and it and it did a good job for Opera as a browser, I think. Mm-hmm. But what are your personal feelings about uh, switching to from uh, HTML, and what what have you seen uh, inside of the company? Some some emotions rather than uh, plans and things like that. Yeah, um, is, is, is is it hard I, to let it go? I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I would say the I think the way that we've approached it uh, as a team has been uh, overall healthy. Um, like there are things that, yeah, we'll miss because we were passionate about them, went and implemented them. And, yeah. you know, uh, especially a lot of the folks that, that wrote a ton of code. Um, yeah. I it's, remember it's, some parts of web platform that mm-hmm. were implemented the best in Edge. Yeah. Yeah. A and lot so, of them. Well, well, and so that, that's, uh, kind of the mental model we're taking with the, you know, engaging with the Chromium community is we actually know a lot of our stuff is really oh, yeah. good with engaging with, uh, when we engaged in the standards body, like a lot of other implementers would, you know, just, kind of dream of seeing our architecture because some of the stuff that we were able to pull off. So like, you know, the, you know, the scrolling, yeah, you know, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. you know, the independent scrolling and rendering. And we had a lot of that stuff before, you know, anybody had it. Um, and so it's, it's, it, that's kind of what we're bringing forward. We actually did a, you know, really in-depth analysis of, you know, what do we have in edge HTML that we believe our current users will miss? Mm-hmm. Um, and so in, you know, when, uh, um, I, I believe it was Jatender Mann uh, wrote an article when the, it was initially announced that we were switching to Chromium mm-hmm. with our intents. And we do plan to bring everything that we feel was really great about our browser, but bringing it into the Chromium code base. Um, so effectively, any browser that you choose on Windows that is running on Chromium will just be great. Because um, ultimately, that's the goal. We want our end users to have a great experience when browsing. Well, as for from developer's side, it's good to have your expertise uh, in open source engine mm-hmm. because Edge HTML it used to be a closed source. Yeah, yeah, and, and Microsoft as a whole is moving more to the yeah, open. Yeah, like at yeah. Build, you saw that we have the Linux kernel built in, which is just a great developer story from end to end with WSL. Um, and so, like, just even developing on Windows, like when you consider like uh, Visual Studio Code is now you know across numerous platforms, and we're investing heavily there and just creating just a wonderful developer I recent, experience. I recently end-end. switched to Visual Studio Code. Yeah, like, oh, that's good to hear. I've, yeah. I've, been, I've been struggling uh, with it because I had uh, different different habits for sure. short, shortcuts. Sure. But then I decided I just I'll just uh, I'll throw away my current editor and just start <laughs> from from the scratch. And I yeah. actually I liked it. So. Yeah. Active user. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And just, just seeing that they, they updated the terminal. I know it's a small thing, but I'm super excited about that. So, so you know, sw- switching over to, for example, over to Windows has never been easier. Yeah. Um, and, and for, for developers of, you know, all types, but, you know, when we, when we would interact with web developers, you know, we would go through the things of, you know, what was blocking them. Um, and a lot of times it would just come down to like Windows versus Unix, right. uh, basically expectations. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and so it's just really exciting that the the pathway and like the built-in kernel will improve performance so much. It's just very, very exciting. Okay. Uh, back in my Opera days, we were uh, happy to to hear from Google that we're welcomed mm-hmm. uh, in, in in Chromium project because mm-hmm. we had a lot of expertise as well on our mm-hmm. Presto engine. Yeah. And uh, what what how they how they um, react on on your decision? What what uh, are they uh, welcoming you or like? Oh, yeah. uh, do you work closely? Uh, yeah, yeah. Google has been uh, super welcoming. Uh, we've uh, we've. But but like not even Google alone, the entire Chromium community has been very welcoming, uh, and our team has kind of jumped in with uh, both feet, uh, you know, head first because we do have we have a lot of um, uh, expertise, especially on Windows. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's that we're we're also having to ramp up on the Chromium code base. You don't just yeah, magically yeah. know like you know how a rendering engine works, but their architecture is completely different yeah, and all that yeah. stuff. So we're ramping up in that space. And one of the areas where the Chromium community has really helped out is they've like for example pointed us to really good first bugs. For our engineers that are wanting to ramp up in those spaces, All right. for example, like the accessibility and the scrolling that we want mm-hmm, to bring, mm-hmm. uh, they've really helped uh, us along. Uh, and again, that's the Chromium community, not necessarily just Google, even though they they're a big portion of the Chromium community. Okay, they are they're being friendly. That's that's a good thing. But mm-hmm. what about competition? Because mm-hmm. uh, it's it's a it's a healthy thing. Yeah, I guess yeah. You, you you would agree. Mm-hmm. Um, what about competition inside of Chromium project? Do you have a Influence? Will you have some influence in the Chromium project because it will it will make it uh, healthier? Yeah, yeah. So so it's it's uh, do you ask kind of a few different questions there? So yeah, like, yeah. is is there competition and like is I it kind of feels like is there, you know, kind of like uh, animosity or something happening? <laughs> de- de- definitely not at this stage. Like everything's actually just going great. But like I said, we just started down this path. We don't have to um, fight, but you yeah, can, but yeah. you can, can compete. So so and I, I guess wh- where I would kind of steer that is wh- where we plan to do that is uh-huh. in the standard space. Like that that's you know everything that goes into the platform should be standardized and kind of agreed upon. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we still plan to heavily invest in our uh, you know attending standards. Having opinions, debating them in the open, and one of the biggest things is not necessarily just having just having opinions, but having technical opinions and, and more importantly, end user empathy to back up those opinions, mm-hmm. uh, which should hopefully drive drive the APIs that ultimately land in Chromium, okay. um, and we can work out those implementation details uh, later, and hopefully the relationships we're, we're fostering now through fixing those bugs, landing the accessibility stuff, um, and the scrolling will just continue to further. Uh, you know, uh, make a make our uh, relationships and our stake within Chromium stronger. Uh, why I ask about this because um, sometimes when something's happening inside of a Chromium project and so, some feature requests, some mm-hmm. bug, and if, if Google is not willing to fix it mm-hmm. or it, they have different priorities, mm-hmm. it just stays the same. Mm-hmm. So, th- what, what kind of competition it uh, we, we miss in Chromium project that uh, some some company with uh, resources with some influence mm-hmm. would take those bugs and uh, try to fix it. I, I actually think uh, if you look at, for example, the accessibility work that we're doing on UIA mm-hmm. um, is actually a good example of, of that, as well as uh, some of the editing work we're picking up. Um, uh, we, we've, uh, we're looking into uh, the scrolling stuff. So it's, yeah, yeah. it's, one, it's one, like, like, I don't want to like rehash the same ones, but like, like yeah. I said, we're kind of early in this journey. Um, but I, I think we are... There's areas where Google has a business priority to focus on the web platform, and sometimes that's actually just like resource driven. They don't have enough time to go, yep. you know, spend a ton of time everywhere. And we can kind of come in and fill those gaps if our end users as well as web developers are wanting that. And sometimes it feels like they implement first and then spec second. Hmm. So it feels like it feels wrong. Okay. Uh, I wonder if you were, if you're gonna choose a different approach. Um. So like I I think there's. I, I feel like uh, that may be kind of an overloaded question because some, <laughs> sometimes it's it's worth knowing whether or not you could potentially even implement something to go spec. Yeah. Um, but I, I definitely feel like it's worth always, hey, is this something, you know, you all would be interested in implementing? And then, you know, what is the story for wanting to go implement this thing? Not just because we would think it's cool or something. And personally speaking, in the CSS working group uh, with Google, I've never experienced Mm-hmm. That uh, that specific thing you're you're uh-huh. speaking about, they've yep. always been very upfront about what they plan to work on, even if they intend to go prototype stuff. Which, the, the, uh, being a simpler impl- implementer, I actually really appreciate. Okay, uh, speaking of your CSS working group involvement, mm-hmm. what's what's your role there? Um, so I I co-author the Resize Observer specification, right. and and I think um, 
through the years, you brought up Compat, uh, through the years, I, editing specs was not a priority in mm-hmm. as much as, hey, we found a bunch of Compat issues with Flexbox, for example, or we found Compat issues with Grid while we were implementing it. And we kind of need to raise those. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's more of kind of like refining the specifications, less innovating and that type of stuff. But I expect us to to shift. Uh, and you actually can see that not necessarily in the CSS working group, mm-hmm. although you actually you can see that because we just proposed the high contrast stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and so like, really excited to be able to move to that where our end users and web developers, we've heard through the years a ton of problems. And now we can kind of shift to trying to solve those problems rather than just kind of keeping pace with Compat. Yeah, that's 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 good to know. Um, as for CSS working group, I I hear a lot of questions from from developers. Hmm. Why CSS is so slow compared okay. to JavaScript? Because JavaScript is involving in in, in, in a huge steps. I mean, there every day there is a new proposal. Every every month there is a new feature almost implemented and spec'd, and uh, mm-hmm. we have a polyfill for this and polyfill for that. And developers mm-hmm. start to use it, and transpiling it with Babel and things like that, mm-hmm. and it feels like it's moving every every day and become it becomes better and better and better. As mm-hmm. for CSS, it feels like well, we we spend ten years on grids, mm-hmm. we spend another ten five years on on this on that, and uh, we don't mm-hmm. actually see the progress. It feels like. What's your take on that? So I I, I think it's probably a multitude of things. Uh, First of all, JavaScript and CSS are nothing alike. Yeah, uh, of course, but so, it, but you yeah. know, it's abbrevi- one mm-hmm. abbreviation, another abbreviation. Like HTML, CSS, JavaScript, it, it, they they, sh- they they feel the same when you when, when you look at it at just just the names, but sure. inside they they're so different. Yeah, yeah, and and so I I would I would posit that uh, for example, you brought up Grid and Flexbox. Um, there, there's actually a few reasons those take a long time is because coming up with a generalized layout system is actually very, very, very complicated. And you have to think of all kinds of potential different scenarios. And a lot of them you don't actually run into until you begin implementing them. Oh, yeah. Um, and then you have to, like, again, take into account, like, painting. And, you know, can this animate? Can this not animate? If it's going to animate, how is it going to animate? Um, and all these different... And, and, like, then you also take into account the cascade. Okay, well, how are we going to serialize these down? Like, there's just, there's just a yeah. ton of things that... I think are easy to pretend don't exist. And then on top of that, and, and I've seen a lot of uh, folks on Twitter actually trying to advocate and something I completely support as well is the folks that actually engage and do work is actually a very small portion of the CSS working group. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, which is rather unfortunate because I think if we could scale it out from a few individuals, you would actually be able to see much faster things. That said, to your point with regards to polyfilling, that's actually very complicated to do for CSS. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Because, if, for example, if you wanted to go polyfill a new uh, a property or something like that, you have to effectively re-implement the cascade or do it in some oh, kind yeah. of like hacky yeah. fashion. Um, so it's it's very complicated, and I think uh, with things such as like CSS Houdini, we'll be able to unlock that uh, potential. Yeah, to polyfill with actual JavaScript yeah, running yeah. In the background and, and uh, emulating browser's behavior. Yeah, and you, in yeah, a way. yeah, and you just get the hook right in rather than, you know, again, like I said, just going and re-implementing the cascade in JavaScript, which is not performance. Rachel Andre recently uh, joined uh, a CSS working group uh, representing uh, this Frontiers mm-hmm. uh, community in Netherlands. Yeah. Is it something new? I think I think it never happened before. Something like uh, to have a, a developer's representative on CSS working group, not just invited ex- expert, but a okay. representative of a community. So um, I can't really speak to that because I haven't uh-huh. been in the CSS working group the entire time. Uh-huh. But I was thrilled when that happened uh, because Rachel is such a wonderful talent and in such a you know so competent, able to articulate not only to the developer community but back to us how mm-hmm. to make the entire feature set better. Um, so I, I'm just thrilled because no longer is she having to try to figure out how to fund you know yeah. her way over to the the standards bodies because she is a, a very very valuable. Uh, team member to have in the working mm-hmm, group. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm thrilled that Frontier stepped up and was able to make that happen. Yeah, because it, it feels like it's happening for the first time, really. Mm. Uh, because, uh, again, another thing that I hear from developers uh, discussing CSS working group and CSS in general, that as a, as a member of CSS working group, mm-hmm. you're trying to solve uh, problems that 
not exist in, in developers' world. Mm. We are, n- are not trying to solve everyday problems. That's why CSS mm-hmm. and JS solutions like came up sure. all of a sudden, yeah. and uh, de- like preprocessors and mm-hmm. uh, CSS and JS solutions and things like that. So we are not solving those problems, kind of. Mm-hmm. Uh, and developers trying to solve it using JavaScript and uh, different different sure. kind of engines. Why is it so? Why? Uh, I mean, it's it's good to have racial there, but it, mm-hmm. it will take some time to to convey uh, developer needs to a sure. success working group. But uh, mm-hmm. why 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 we have a situation like that? I, I guess the the one of the things I'll, I'll kind of take a step back is like one of the things that I actually thought was super awesome that changed. Maybe it's two years ago at this point was us moving all of the communication over to GitHub. Oh, yeah. um, which was That's so much better than W W style. Yeah, yeah, and so because <laughs> the majority of web developers didn't even know it existed, nor how to contact, and it, you know, didn't know how to how to navigate them. <laughs> exactly, and so I, I think that was a major turning point because we actually welcome all web developers to provide feedback. The CSS and JS one is actually a very interesting one that we've pondered at least on our team a few times mm-hmm. because it's actually a very, very, very complicated problem to solve. Oh yeah. But it would definitely need uh, more thorough digging. That said, are are we not solving the problems that uh, web developers have? I don't know if I'll 100% agree with that because usually the problems that are brought forth are brought forth with people that are actively trying to solve those problems. Now, is there larger problems we could potentially be solving? Mm -hmm. Um, Sure. Uh, And and, and again, I also, uh, while there's a few main key contributors, there's always people on pockets working on things, trying to move things forward, um, gaining implementer interest. Uh, like I actually think you were talking about preprocessors, you know, custom properties coming into play. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's also one of those things where, again, very, very simple to say, why haven't they solved this problem? And then when you go to implement it, uh, SAS and others uh, get the benefit of just doing transpilation over into yeah, CSS. Yeah. And whereas... Having to like make it all work with the cascade as well as then give JavaScript hooks, it's it's much more complicated than just make variables and work. So much more useful. Yeah, uh, and so much yeah. it's so so deeply integrated into the browsers and how they work. Yeah. It's not just a find and replace. Sure, and, and it's so like, much better. Well, well, like I actually don't want to discredit like anything the SAS team did because I yeah. actually think it's a great example. Of, like the you know the it's not necessarily what the extensible web manifesto was about, but uh, without Houdini, it's very hard for them to actually do it in JavaScript. Yeah, of course. But it's it's a good example of taking something that users or web developers really loved and bringing it into the platform. But yeah, unfortunately, it's sometimes at times more complicated to go just implement it in the engine. It's not, anyways, and. Uh, yeah, I guess that's one of the things I would try to get across is we do have to think about a lot of minutia um, yeah, yeah. in order to actually have a solid feature that will work cross-browser. Uh, have you seen this uh, post-CSS preset uh, and environment uh, project that trying to, to, to bring staging into CSS yes. uh, spec involvement? Yes, I actually was just... It's kind of funny you brought that up I, 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 because uh, I was actually just talking to Matthias uh, over oh. at the web tent uh, about... The fact that folks have asked, you know, uh, effectively the W3C, because it's not a CSS working group thing, the uh-huh. W3C to have staging. Uh, and, and be honest with you, I'm not opposed to it because a lot of times the editor's draft are actually the, the thing implementers are implementing against. And, you know, the, uh, the actual, you know, working drafts may be a little bit behind. So not up to date, and then so the, you're not sticking to the actual W3C. Uh, uh, no, we are. Pro- it's pro- just, process. No, we are. It's just. Because it's the, like author draft, like working draft, editor yeah. draft, so, so, like so, well, well, so, so many different. Well, and you're usually implementing it, you know, like you'll propose an issue and they'll go make the change to the editor's draft because you found it because you're in the middle of editing, you're implementing right. it. And so like you're kind of working from the editor's draft. And we, like one cool thing is this actually drove a lot of actual changes in the W3C where uh-huh. they made CRs faster and quicker to update yeah. as well as work working drafts so that we can push them faster. But um, I, I think the biggest thing the stage thing solves for you is if you asked 100 web devs, like what does ED, <laughs> what does WD, and what does oh, REC yeah. mean? Yeah. I think you would get a lot of different answers. And I think most people would think at recommendation time, that's when browsers should go implement, which it's act- actually the exact inverse of of uh basically rec means it's actually been implemented in yeah, numerous yeah. different implementations and thus proves the validity of the specification and it has a test suite like one two three four is much 
easier to understand than E D W D. To be completely honest with you, I know, I know it's one, two, three, four. I don't know necessarily what the stages represent beyond I know one starts first and two and then three and then four comes like I can count kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, I believe, I believe four means uh, that's, that's already implemented everywhere. So it's, okay. it's a part of a spec. So, so similar to, to what rec would be. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I personally wouldn't be opposed to it, but it's definitely not a CSS working group thing. That would yeah. be something you would want to probably take to, you know, W3C and the AC board in general. But I wonder if it would be even possible to, to, to organize all different, like, how many specs do you have? Like, is you one of the CSS working group? Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. like 30. 30? Modules. Yeah, yeah, modules. Mm-hmm. Uh, and would it be possible to organize those into, into groups like first stage, second stage, mm-hmm. third, fourth? We could. I, I, I just think it would be more valuable to do it at a W3C level, yeah. which would impact ours. So rather than Let's do the work of both keeping in process with the W3C also while doing our own little thing. I just don't think is nearly as valuable. The one thing, though, that I would actually love to see on that post CSS, and we've actually, I actually have the domain name for this and I just haven't gotten around to doing it. <laughs> Can I use? Uh, but actually doing why can't I use? Uh, because so many, so many things are like just rehashed. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's actually good to rehash them because, you know, something that was said we couldn't do a decade ago, maybe we can now. Yeah. But, uh, like, I actually would love to also see uh, that on this site of that's actually already been proposed and it's at, like, stage unavailable, undefined or whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, if we're going to take JavaScript stuff, you know, in a n Because, yeah, basically we we can't do it right now for these reasons or whatever. It's good. To, it's always good to know those reasons, but usually there are like circle dependencies or something like... Yeah, it's it's a very interesting, like Resize Observer is a good example of that. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. a lot of people want container queries right within CSS. And I don't think that's in... I don't think that's completely impossible, but the but way the it, rendering... You can always engine, limit it. Yeah, the rend... The re, well, and that's what Resize Observer does. It basically looks for cyclic dependencies and how often we're iterating mm-hmm. over the thing. And the browsers are given kind of leeway of figuring out when they just want to say, dude, we're in an infinite loop, yeah, we're yeah. going to bail. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, but the rendering engine works a certain way. Like you end up with a DOM, yeah, yeah. CSS then gets cascaded over top of that, and you move through the, and, and then JavaScript just happens to be one of those areas where you can affect the pipeline. Whereas like the, the rest yeah. of it is very sequential. Um, and so to be able to come back through and flush the, the loop, it's, um, JavaScript's just, it's, it's really geared towards making that happen. That said, it's kind of a dream of mine to bring that into CSS. Uh, we'll see how we go about trying to do that, but it'll have to use very similar mechanisms under the hood. But I also agree with a lot of web developers that, you know, it feels kind of dirty to reach for JavaScript when it feels yeah. like a styling thing. Yeah, um, yeah. So I agree with that, but uh, we'll see how that goes. But what, what's, what's their use case for for those staging uh, in, in CSS specs? They just want to write the modern CSS, like to use this color mod function, for mm-hmm. example, and okay. modify colors mm-hmm. uh, on the fly, not just on a preprocessor step. Sure. Yeah. Uh, and that's why they want to have some sort of Preprocessing uh, based mm-hmm. on stage. Like if you're if you if you're if you feel adventurous, mm-hmm. you go for the for the first stage. Sure. Yeah. If if you want a, something stable, you go for the fourth. Mm-hmm. And yeah, the, the, those kind of uh, clear levels of support mm-hmm. would be nice to have. That's that's yeah. that's the use case. Yeah, I don't I don't disagree with you. But like I said, I would probably want it at the W three C level. Yeah. Just because like I actually work in two or three different working groups, and I I would hate <laughs> to have to jump back and forth. Uh, between the various ones and try to remember which one's following, you know, numbered yeah. stages and one's following the EDWD rec path. And w- w- there's, a, there's another important part of this uh, developer's dream to, to have levels and to have, like, to write the the, the most modern uh, version of CSS mm-hmm. is polyfilling because yeah. um, there's the, there's no way to just change one uh, function to another to have a fallback. Sometimes you just need JavaScript to, to or yeah. some some sort of uh, interaction with browser to, to, to make it work. Mm-hmm. I wonder if it's if it's if it's ever gonna happen that you're writing the modern CSS and uh, all of a sudden it, it transpiles into old CSS plus some JavaScript written for mm. Houdini that okay. also runs in a browser. Does it does it even make sense? The transpile part, I mean, you could because I mean that's one of the main goals of CSS Houdini is to allow to to effectively 
make polyfilling of CSS easier and also kind of allows the standards bodies to get out of, like like I was saying, layout uh, is a very complicated thing. So you to don't spec. have to implement it in a browser. You can implement it via polyfill first, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and effectively what you would then be able to do is, let's say, like one thing that's been interesting and grid kind of gets you some of the way there. Um, and then also some of the sizing attributes, but like one that's been requested a few times is like constraint based layout, mm -hmm. uh, that you see on like iOS and Android. And, and like I said, like flex and, and grid you get you pretty close, um, to, to most of the use cases for constraint based layout. But, uh, you would be able to go and put that together in a JavaScript library, mm -hmm. actually hooking into layout as well as the parser under the hood. Uh, it's very similar to how, like, if you want to polyfill something on JavaScript, everything's, you know, on the prototype chain, you can just extend and you can add to it and replace. Mm -hmm. That's the same thing we want to be able to unlock, uh, within CSS to be able to say, Hey, and that's actually why CSS variables got converted into custom properties. Yeah. Because we were working on Houdini at the same time and Tab Atkins, who's a spec editor on both. Yeah. Kind of was like, Hey, let's just use the same methodology. And so then people can create their own custom property yeah. where they're able to then actually define uh, like what it can take, you know, whether it can take, you know, lengths, you know, length percentage, yeah, yeah. so on. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting times. Uh, personally, the main thing I just want access to for some of my own personal reasons is directly to the parser because the amount of times people write parsing for, you know, colors and stuff, it's mm -hmm. just hardcore regex when literally the parser already knows how to do that. Oh, yeah. That's, that's, it's already there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's literally in the engine. You just can't access it. So That's funny. Yeah. Uh, there's another use case for, for Houdini. It's not just polyfilling uh, mm -hmm. new CSS, but creating something new, like, for example, your custom rounding borders mm -hmm. or something like that. Like, you, yep. you know, this uh, Apple uh, roundness that it's, it looks better, okay. <laughs> basically. Yeah. So being able to, to implement your border rounding uh, using mm -hmm. Houdini, it's, it's a good thing. But is there more than that? Would, would, would Houdini change the, the way we, we write CSS, the language itself? Or it's just uh, something extra that you can put uh, on top of CSS? So I, th I think it's technically something you can put on top of CSS. And I think one thing that's been misconstrued a few times is that the idea is Houdini, everybody will now write JavaScript and that will achieve their uh -huh. CSS. When in actuality, it's hopefully, you know, 98% of people are still writing CSS as they do now. It's just somebody came out with effectively one that we've been requested numerous times with CSS Grid is Pinterest-based layout, you know, where right. it's kind of masonry layout. Uh -huh. We we kind of want to unlock Houdini to allow you to go, like, if you want Pinterest-based layout, you actually just have access to the layout boxes and the layout engine itself to then go through, iterate over top of the boxes, and you can do your own. Uh, for example, when SubGrid was initially announced for Grid Level 2, uh -huh. um, a friend of mine, Francois Remy, actually went and implemented it on top of the layout API prototype that's within uh, Chrome. Really? And, and literally, it's, I think, maybe 60 lines of JavaScript. <laughs> but that, that's, that's the beautiful thing uh, that web developers have ac access to, is they have the context of what they're trying to lay out, mm -hmm. whereas the CSS Working Group has to consider every potential context that any web developer may ever be in. And so, like, 80% of people may only want that 1% of yeah, things yeah. and we're spending so much time trying to fill the other 99%. Uh, so like I think Houdini is going to pay off because what, what we'll end up seeing is a ton of stuff being used similar to within JavaScript like jQuery is actually a good example like mm -hmm. the majority of jQuery was CSS selectors and so yeah, we yeah, got yeah. you know query selector and query selector all out of that um, and so we'll be able to see layout paradigms and we'll actually have implementation code we can see and we'll yeah, be like the yeah. most used routes are this let's go standardize this and put this into the engine so that it can we can potentially like maybe parallelize it and all that other stuff okay um so yeah it's pretty exciting but maybe with houdini in their hands developers will, will leave you alone uh CSS, uh CSS working group with their with their tiny needs not not the global ones i, I would say yeah and no like I, I yeah yeah i like most things with the platform i want to just unlock so they can create awesome awesome things uh not not necessarily make it so we we have nothing else to do, but so that we can uh -huh. we can focus on all those other things that people are potentially yeah. saying we aren't spending our time on. We can move away from you know those minutia things like I was referring to. What's what's the population of the Earth currently? Like seven billion people? Like you have seven seven billion sure. customers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know how many of them are actually on the internet these days, but, uh, but still. it's pretty high. Yeah, it's yeah. pretty high. So yeah, there's there's. There's a lot of people using the web. And so, yeah, for the CSS working group and 
uh, the W3C in general, there's a lot of potential requests. Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And luckily I'm not uh, the only one working on it by like by any stretch. There's people that do way more than I do. You were listening to 175th special episode of Web Standard Podcast. Thank you for joining us today, Greg. Yeah, thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you for listening. Uh, see you next week in the regular Russian-speaking podcast. Cheers. Goodbye.